And just before uh, we get started in this session, um, I just wanted to um, to give both Bob and Tiki uh, a really big thank you for um, pulling off this long-awaited meeting. I, I think you know we're kind of getting started into the meeting and stuff, and it's already been amazing. So can we give them a round of applause? Please? All right, I'm really excited about this first panel discussion. It's going to be so cool. So um, you guys, like we have an amazing uh, set of speakers today um, that, that are going to kind of set the tone uh, for, for the, this panel discussion on standards, guidelines, and proficiency testing. And, um, and But you guys are not off the hook, those of you who are not on the panel. Um, you don't get to sit in the hot seat, but please, please think of things, questions, and, and, and comments and things. Uh, we want you guys to be involved in the, in the panel discussion as well. Um, and I think I can say that for all the discussions, we really want to have a lot of dialogue back and forth and perspectives. So um, I'm going to give, give a, little, a little bit of a, 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 a an intro. Uh, I wanted to give a, a territorial acknowledgement. Uh, I, I'm, I'm from the University of Victoria in Victoria, British Columbia, and uh, and I live, work, and play uh, on on territories of the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Wasanich peoples um, that that have relationships to the land to this day, but also um, uh, have the privilege of of working with a number of uh, Indigenous peoples uh, within. The iTrack DNA project that you've heard a bit about already, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Um, and and through other amazing projects, and in particular, um, I want to give a shout out to the um, Anishinaabe, Cree, Bitnyao, Blueberry River First Nations, High Slot, and the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, with whom we've been working very closely with on a number of projects. So um, we've already heard in, in many of, of the, the talks that we've had so far, and, and they've been absolutely amazing, haven't they? I think we should give a round of applause for that. <laughs> Many, many of the talks have, have touched on or, or, or explicitly said, like Merida, uh, for example, about the importance and the need for standards and guidelines uh, and, and how important these things are. And there's been a, a number of, of really smart and amazing people that have been working hard to make these things reality. And, um, and, and there's a lot of things with eDNA, it's particularly challenging because we have, have to deal with things like everybody using the same terminology. We need to talk about uh, you know, standards and study design and, and so on. You know, I've got the list up there. But the challenges are that there's no one size fits all. And, you know, and especially when we're talking about standards, uh, we, we, we don't want to necessarily be prescriptive about every single you know, little thing because it isn't one size fits all. So how in the world can we do that? It's really, really challenging. And again, many people have been, been working hard um, to, to make, make these guide, guidelines and so on reality. In Canada, um, I'm really happy to say that, that we've been in the forefront for actually creating national standards uh, for, um, for environmental DNA studies. And the first standard is already out. It was published um, in November 2021. And it focused, focuses, it's out there, um, it focuses on uh, um, the reporting requirements and terminology. So it's it's a it's it's you know starting at the very basics, um, but very critically so. And there are a number of, of people in this room that actually were involved uh, on the technical committee, um, as well as uh, Ken, who um, who was a manager for this uh, standard um, that that contributed to the standard. And Ken's going to describe as one of our featured speakers. 
um, how the, the, the standards making process in Canada through the Canadian Standards Association have, um, is done. It's very rigorous and, and we still have like, you know, whip marks on, on our backs, I think, right Chris? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, keep us all in line. But um, this, this document, uh, the QR code to, to get to it is up here. So feel free to, to, um, to scan it with your phones. And uh, it's, it's actually freely available for viewing in Canada. Those of you who are not, uh, not living in Canada or whatever, uh, or if you want to have your own personal copy um, as a Canadian, you can still have access to this. Um, you have to, to pay a, a small fee. But, um, this is for not only Canadians, it's really about, you know, reaching out to beyond Canada and, and, um, and, and facilitating uh, um, adoption for um, eDNA. So we're going to hear a bit more about this. And the, uh, the terminology covers all aspects of eDNA study design from start to finish. And it includes metagenomics, it includes uh, metabarcoding, it includes um, uh, uh, qPCR-based methods and so on. Things that, that, that you need to report or think about when you're actually uh, um, you know, designing experiments and so on. So I, I strongly urge each and every one of you to look at this document. Now, that about the same, around the same time as when that document came out, um, we were fortunate enough to, um, to find out that we were successfully um, awarded a, uh, uh, funding through Genome Canada and Genome BC and Genome Quebec uh, for the iTrack DNA project. And uh, this is a, a project that is a, a four-year project so, uh, worth about uh, $12 million or so. It's a large-scale applied project um, that, that is literally across the country and, and also includes um, wonderful collaborators uh, in the U.S. as well. And, um, and uh, the goal of, of iTrack DNA was to fill critical knowledge gaps that were essential for competent eDNA uptake. Um, we wanted to kind of divert the Wild West approach to eDNA and, and really, you know, settle down and, and really focus on, on those quality measures that um, are required in order to, for confident uptake to occur. And we've heard a lot about that already um, today. And that includes focusing on robust assay uh, uh, and study design and also generating uh, valuable genomics resources like full mitochondrial genomes that can then be used for robust assay design. Um, also, the project uh, was geared towards promoting national standards creation um, and developing training and proficiency uh, testing frameworks, and then also um, focusing on uh, reaching into communities um, and, and facilitating data collection and modeling, um, incorporating indigenous ecological knowledge, like, uh, for example, what Louis had, uh, talked about today. Um, at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do here is raise end user capacity and proficiency in the use of eDNA methods. We can't do this alone. This project involves a number of amazing collaborators uh, from all sectors, and uh, we have over 46 collaborators. Um, so, uh, so it's it's been a really amazing uh, opportunity, and that includes, um, uh, in particular, for this project, uh, collaborators uh, that include the First Nations here, the the Blueberry River Gitmo, um the UHE and the Apatuini First Nations. I also wanted to quickly acknowledge the folks in my lab, uh, four of which are, are uh, here today um, and are more than happy to tell you about the work that they're doing um, in, in the project. So the neat thing about iTrack DNA is that we were able to 
um, support the creation of the second national standard, which is going to be coming out by the fall of this year. And it's focusing on performance criteria for qPCR-based assays for eDNA applications. And what I've uh, done here is, is just, just briefly given you an outline of what to expect in the standard. It went through a public consultation period, um, which is now finished. And it really focuses on analytical performance um, and so on uh, to help guide people in knowing when an assay is conforming to minimum performance standards. So we're really excited about this. Um, and um, and it, it also, uh, this, the standard helped to inform us um, on another aspect that I wanted to touch on very briefly before introducing uh, the first featured speaker. And that is, um, that is doing proficiency testing. So um, the proficiency testing is absolutely in, uh, important in terms of assessing lab performance, um, like compared to other labs and so on, to, to ensure that you have you know, some kind of competency and, and quality control that you can compare. So, so it's a very important um, mainstay of, of, of competent adoption. But one of the challenges here is, is trying to develop a proficiency testing framework for eDNA. It's hard. <laughs> so in iTrack, we've tackled it. Thank you. Um, we've tackled it to um, and, and kind of divided it into, into uh, a number of baby steps that I've outlined on the slide here. So um, we've, we've allocated like a three-year period in the project to, um, to start working on this. And, um, and what, we're, what we first started, started, started out with is just checking to see, given people's um, setups in the lab, we're focusing only on quantitative PCR um, on, on these, these activities. And, um, and what we did was, was focus on giving everybody the same reagents and saying, okay, given your equipment, run. We'll give you the run conditions and everything. Um, we'll give you the reagents and that, and you run it on your machines, use your pipettes and everything, and let's see what happens. And, um, and, and then um, after that, we get, get a little bit more complicated. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the results of the first phase of, of the proficiency testing thing. The rest is still yet to come, um, but it gets successively more difficult in that we, we then want to go to, um, okay, now you guys order your reagents by yourself, make your, make your dilutions by yourself, and that use your use your lab um, and and then let's compare results and then in, uh, after that we actually get to providing filters to people um, I forgot to mention this is all like reagents using G blocks so nice and simple at first and um, and then we, we only tackle like like real samples um, filters that are prepared by by people uh, by one single lab. Um, later on in the year two activity. And then finally, we want to progress to um, moving into different kinds of, of uh, environmental matrices and so on and refine things. And, and we're, we're already engaging our Proficiency Testing Canada and NIST in the States to uh, talk about how we could potentially, um, you know, generate some kinds of matrix standards. Okay, so, so what we did, uh, so in this first phase was, was we focused on G-blocks. Again, we, 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 um, in my lab, we prepared all the dilutions needed to create standard curves. We focused on one assay, and we provided all the reagents, including the enzymes and everything, to every single lab that was participating. We had 17 labs that were participating across Canada and the States. And, um, and, and you can see that there was a, a really nice breakdown there. Uh, and this included um, the labs that were, are involved with, uh, with the ReadyNet program that Adam's going to be talking about later. 
So um, of those, um, we had 20 attempts. So some labs decided they wanted to try on two different machines. Some labs um, uh, wanted to, uh, to try, it, try it twice and, and so on. Of those attempts, um, well, three failed, 17 were successful. And I just noted here, the thermal cyclers were all over the map, different kinds of thermal cyclers. Um, but generally, they were ABIs or BioRed units. And then they were asked to provide us with, with a variety of performance characteristics. So these are outlined in the upcoming standard. But basically, um, what, what, um, what they were uh, asked to do was to provide us with a limited quantification for the assay that they were running and, uh, and a continuous LOQ, um, which is like a breakpoint between continuous data and binomial data for the low copy number stuff. So on the right hand side, you can see, see the, um, like an example of a result, beautiful standard curves. And um, the, the slopes and the y-intercepts from these 17 determinations were extremely tight. Very, very tight data. Then when the limits of detection and limits of quantification were, were determined um, from these using binomial data, um, you can see that in all 17 determinations, regardless of what lab, they were, the data were pretty darn good and very, very impressively close. So we're really excited about, about the fact that, um, that, these, that the initial determination was really good. We figured out, for example, that uh, if you have a power outage, that that's not good for reproducibility. <laughs> so that was one failure. Another, another failure was, was there were multiple people that were doing parts of running plates and things. Um, so that's been worked out now too. So in, in all cases, the, there's things that have been explained, but again, the data are incredibly tight. And we're now working on phase two, which is everybody buys the reagents themselves and, and we give them instructions and we'll see how that works out. And we've expanded it from one assay to three now for, through the iTrack program.